So would you take your Bibles, please, quickly, to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to try to go fast if it's okay with you. And if you have to leave, I understand. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, I beseech you, I, I implore you, I entreat you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Just stop there for a moment. I was a young believer. I was in my teens. I was just starting to read the Bible a little bit. I'd been a believer for just a short while. And I was directed to read the book of Romans. I came to chapter 12 and I started to read, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I thought, as I interact with it, what do you mean, God? That I should give my body to you, and it's my reasonable service. What do you mean? Um, if you ask me to give my life to you, and you mean 50%, or sometimes, or once in a while, to give some of my gifts, some of my time, some of my money, but that's a little, uh, that's a little uh, ambitious to ask that I present my body a living sacrifice. I, all the sacrifices I read about in the Bible, they're dead sacrifices. They're slain, like Abraham was going to kill his son Isaac, uh, slit the note, and the animals were blood sacrifices. Uh, they were dead. And you're saying that you want me to present my body back to you, a living sacrifice. And I said, uh, ask for 50%. Uh, because at that time, quite literally, uh, I was being told so many things that I shouldn't do because I was doing them. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy. If, as I understood it, if I give my body my heart, my mind, my possessions, if I give my body to God as messed up as I am, I was a teenager now, God says it's holy, it blew me away, because I knew my life was anything but holy. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, and it's acceptable unto God, God will accept it if you will give it. I thought, <laughs> there's gotta be something wrong with him. I told you I was a teenager. Um, a missionary had come into our little candy store, our luncheonette, came back week after week, month after month for a couple of years. Uh, at first, my mother wanted to throw her out of the store when she started to talk about Jesus, but it was a public place, so she didn't do it. But she didn't like the woman, and I disliked her even more. She'd come back week after week. We found out she was a missionary. That was terrible for us. That was worse than a dirty word, a missionary in the Jewish community, and ours was a Jewish community. And uh, she, we found out, would go knock on the doors one street and another and try to engage them in conversation and give people uh, booklets or brochures or Bibles. And these were almost all Jewish people. This was a Jewish community, and she wasn't very liked at all, but she'd come back week after week after week, month after month for years. Slowly, she'd come in and order a sandwich or something to eat, tuna fish or something, and. Uh, she'd come after the lunch hour deliberately because she knew it wouldn't be crowded then. She wanted to be able to engage my mother in conversation. And so slowly she began to talk to my mother week after week. My mother at first said, well, she's not too bad. And then she said, well, I, I kind of like her. And then after time she looked forward to her coming. And uh, she began to read what uh, the woman told her to read. And after a period of time, my mother came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw such a dramatic change in my mother that I said, it's got to be true, and I accepted Christ. But when I did that, I thought that has nothing whatsoever to do with the here and now. It only has to do with the by and by. My mother knew better than that. and She was growing, and she was waiting for the woman to come to teach her each week from the Word of God. And then we, she would go to a Bible study where the woman lived, and my mother would force me as a teenager to come with her. 
but uh, I would go to the movies. And this missionary said, you shouldn't go to the movies to see those pictures. I thought she was crazy. She said, you couldn't go to dances. I was popular to go to dances in those days, and I, I won a national dance contest on television and uh, loved to dance, and we'd go to some of these big lands, uh, dances. And she said, you can't go to that. I like to play cards. And we'd have pennies and nickels uh, for money, poker, and so forth, and she knew about that. She said, you can't play cards. And she's, then she heard from my mother, she says, you have to stop playing five minutes in Paris with some of these girls. You're really old. You know what five minutes in Paris is. You really, I don't know where you lived, in the jungle somewhere. At any rate, the point I'm trying to make is everything I was tr doing, I was told it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. I was a kid. I was a teenager. I don't know what I was, maybe uh, about 17 then. And so I rebelled against God, went off to the military. I still believed, I believed that Jesus was my savior, he died for me, but I wasn't living for him at all. Because people, a number of believers, who got wind of my lifestyle would say, you shouldn't do that, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do this. Now this was in a very conservative, evangelical, fundamental group. I thank God for them till the end of time. But uh, they were telling me, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, but they never told me why. And later, many years later, through a lot of e e events, uh, I wound off, well, wound up being in Bible college and then seminary for a while and then into the pastorate. And with the young people, I always tried, if I was preaching the word of God and said, you should not, I always tried to tell them, here's why. And I think it's lacking in conservative evangelical Christianity today to tell people, you couldn't do that. Tell them why, biblically, why. So here in chapter 12, every one of the Apostle Paul's letters, every one of the Apostle Paul's letters, without exception, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, doesn't matter, in every one of them, I challenge you to tell me I'm wrong. In every one of them, the Apostle Paul would give you truth or doctrine. And then he would say, in light of that truth, in light of that doctrine, here's what you ought to do. He always gave you the reason when he asked you to do something like present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Would you turn with me? I've got to run. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, I was ashamed of the name of Christ when I was growing up. Romans 1, 16. When I was a teenager growing up, after my mother came to faith in Christ and began to mature a little bit, she would get up every morning, early in the morning, clean off all the tables in our candy store, our luncheonette, and on top of the, the napkin holder yeah. with a spring, you know, spring, okay, she'd put a couple of tracks on top. We had a phone booth. Do you know what a phone booth is? Do you know what a phone is? <laughs> we had a phone booth in the back. It was a booth, a door, um, there was a shelf, and there was a, a big yellow pages to look up numbers. <laughs> Shh, look at me, look, you know I'm only 47. <laughs> no, 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 I can remember when you put a nickel in the phone to make a call, and then when it went to a dime, I thought that was robbery. But I can remember that. But she would, on that little shelf, she'd put a couple of tracks. We had two pinball machines. She'd put a couple of tracks on the pinball machines. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of dancing, so we had a machine to play the music. 
You know, it was a nickel or a dime. Now it's 50 cents or a buck if you, if you can find one anymore in a restaurant. To, you don't go to those kind of restaurants. You're all huppity, duffy people. You don't go to the white college or stuff. But my, my mother would witness to everybody would come. Oh, these are all Jewish people. She would witness to them. It got so bad, she decided we're going to have a Bible study. Now, we had the store. It was a long, narrow store. In the back, there was a door that led to a kind of a living room and a kitchen. Up the living room, there were steps. Upstairs were three bedrooms and a bath. We lived behind and above. We'd come down into the, into the store. So my mother said, this is too important. We have to tell everybody about the Lord, the Messiah, the Jesus. So she asked the missionary, can we get a preacher or a pastor over here to teach a Bible study in the back room? You'd go to the back of our store, there was a door and there was a room. And once a week, she'd have a pastor come in to teach a Bible study in the, in the room right behind our store. And inside the store, the pinball machine was playing, the jukebox was on, and the kids were dancing in the back of the store. So here were Jewish kids, if you can visualize, playing the two pinball machines, dancing, cha-cha, you don't even know what that is. Tango, <laughs> mamba, foxtrot. They would do all the dancing. These were all Jewish kids. The, 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 the jukebox is blurring. And you'd hear from the back room, what can wash my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> you have no idea what that is like in a Jewish home. So, then my mother decided, uh, we got to go to church. We've got to go to church. There were no churches in our Jewish community. There were four synagogues. I still remember them well. No churches. This is all Jewish people lived around there, maybe five blocks in each direction. So you had to go a couple miles away. There was a Bible-believing church. My mother said, we'll go there every Sunday morning. We won't open the store. It was the busiest day of the week. So she'd take us to church on Sunday, my younger brother and myself. We'd come back. The store was on the corner. We had big, big plate glass windows all soaped up with, don't buy hair. They flipped their lid. This is Christ's house. <laughs> and I was ashamed of the Lord Jesus as a young teenager. So when I read here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, so if I went into a McDonald's <clears throat> or if I went into another restaurant or I was with some other Jewish kids and were eating something, I would never bow my head and give thanks for the food conspicuously. If I did it at all, it would be something like, hmm, amen, because I was ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But that is not what the Apostle Paul is really talking about here. For he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because there were people in Rome who were saying that Paul was afraid to come to Rome. He could uh, go to Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth, Galatia, all of those other places. But the Big Apple, that's Rome. I mean, um, that's where we have the leaders of the Mustarion, the mystery religions. Uh, here we have the Senate. Here we have the philosophers, the great educators. I mean, if you're looking for education and philosophy and logic, you got it here in Rome. Forget those other little places. So some were beginning to say to Paul that he was afraid to come to Rome. And they were saying, ah, he could go to Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth, Galatia, all of those other places, but not to the Big Apple, not to New York. Can't come to Rome. So look at what Paul says in verse 10. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey in the will of God to come unto you. That's Rome. He says in verse 11, for I long to see you. I, I'm anxious to get there is what he's saying. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift 
to the end you may be established. I want to go there to be able to minister to you as I do in all these other places. Then he says, verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. I wouldn't want you to think wrongly about this. You're thinking I'm afraid to come to Rome. That's not the case. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that sometimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that is by the Lord, the Lord's leading, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other cities. So Paul says, listen, you're, you're right that I didn't get to Rome, but it's not because I was afraid to go to Rome. Rome. I wasn't worried about the philosophers, the educators, the leaders of the Mustaria and the mystery religion, religions. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They will find no flaw, no imperfection, nothing that's illogical. When I say that Jesus is the Son of God who died for the sins of the world and was resurrected on the third day, I'm not ashamed of that. I'll put it up against anybody, anywhere, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, wherever you want to go. That's what Paul was saying when he said, it's not that I'm ashamed to pray. He was saying, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed at all, not even a little bit. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not, Paul? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Well, why, Paul? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The biggest challenge in all of human history, the things that is tougher to reconcile than anything else is how can a holy God who is infinite in his holiness redeem sinful man and not become contaminated by man's sinfulness? That's the issue of the ages. That's the difficult thing for God to have done for us. How could he be holy and redeem us and not become unholy himself? How could he take a holy man or woman and make them perfect for eternity? I am not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Christ. I remember Dr. Harry Ironside. He was a godly preacher of Moody Church in Chicago years ago, many years ago. <clears throat> he wrote a lot of books, even in his older days when he was becoming blind, he was still going out and preaching and writing. He had somebody who would read to him. He told the story of being at a conference. The pastor said to him, uh, one of my parash parashioners, par shows off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for helping me. Uh, said that uh, they have a, a friend who's in the hospital, terminally ill, not a believer. The doctors have done everything they could do, say he's got maybe a couple of days, he's still current, uh, uh, coherent. Would you like to go with me to talk to this man? He said, I certainly would. So they went off to the hospital. There was the man, he was awake, he was coherent. Dr. Ironside knew this was not long term. He had maybe a couple of hours, a couple of days. I have to get right to the issue. And so he tried, uh, said, may I, may I talk to you about Jesus and about how you could have salvation? And this man who was on the bed near death looked up in the eyes. I never forgot reading it. And he said, sir, more than anything in the world, I would like to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. He paused for a moment, then he looked up to the face of Dr. Ironside and said, but sir, I wouldn't want God to do anything wrong to get me in. That's the issue of human history. How can a holy God, who is a consuming fire, how can he redeem sinful man and not be impacted by the sinfulness of that man? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation universally to the Jew, to the Gentile, for therein is the righteousness 
You know what righteousness is? Righteousness is rightness. And rightness is conformity to a standard. And God is a standard. And God himself had to live up to that standard in the saving of us. For therein in the gospel is the righteousness, the rightness of God. Having done that, and I must go very quickly, he then, in the chapters that follow, chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 20, he takes the Jewish people who had the Mosaic law and the Gentiles, very clearly, who had revelation of God in creation. And he looked at the Jew with all his advantages with the Mosaic law, Moses, and the Gentiles who had a revelation of God in creation. And then he says, and he says it again and again and again. All, in context, the Jew and the Gentile, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none, not any. That's what he's saying in these chapters. If you look with me at verse 9, chapter 3. What then? Are we better than they? That is, are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise, in no way. For we have before proved both Jew and Gentile that they are all under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none, that is Jew or Gentile, righteous, no, not one. Verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, that's the Mosaic law, there shall be no flesh justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. Write it down. Romans chapter 1, 2, 3 through verse 20. All have sinned and come short of the glory. You don't have to do anything to be lost. You are lost. From the day you were born, you were lost. Because you're a descendant of Adam and Eve. We commit sins because we have a sin nature. And we're responsible for that because we were in Adam and Eve. Condemnation. The, the difficulty, if you're trying to share your faith with your neighbors or anybody else, the difficulty is not so much in getting them saved. The difficulty is to get them lost. Now understand. They are lost. They are alien, separated from God. They are. It's not maybe later. They are separated from God. They are under condemnation. Once you get somebody to realize that they are under judgment of God, they're going to be eternally separated from him, it is relatively easy to get them to trust Christ. The problem is not to get them saved and initially. It's to get them Lost. They are, but they've got to know it. And then, much easier to lead them to faith in Christ. So now, in chapter 3, verse 21, listen to this. We've just been told that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not any. Jew, Gentile, everybody is separated from God. But now, read it the way it's written by Paul. But now the righteousness of God. What do I care about the righteousness of God? I have none of my own. I'm lost. I'm separated. I'm alienated. I'm going to hell. I'm under condemnation. Not I will be. I am. And if I die that way, it's forever. Get the seriousness of this. But now the righteousness of God without the law, that is human effort, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you look at verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, of, of work. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 21, through chapter 4 and 5, the whole point is justification. And he uses Abraham and David in these texts to show that Abraham and David from the Old Testament we're saved not by keeping the law, but by grace through faith, Abraham and King David. Our illustrations. 
that justification is by grace through faith apart from human efforts. So we had condemnation. Now we're going chapter 3, 21 through chapter 5, justification. And then when you look at chapter 6, just for a second, chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says in verse 2, God forbid, don't even think of it. Now look, what he says is, shall we continue in sin that God's grace might continue to abound toward us? What had Paul just son? What, what did he just showed us? That salvation is by grace through faith, apart from human effort. It's God's grace. God's grace. He saved us. God saved us. God's grace. God's grace. God's grace. He did it all. I'm just the recipient of God's grace. That's what he was illustrating. Man, we're under condemnation. Now they've been justified by grace through faith apart from works. So now somebody says, oh, I got it. It's all by God's grace. Okay. So I did that. I appropriated God's grace. What shall we say then? Chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that God's grace might continue to be manifested toward us? I got it. Paul, you said salvation is by grace through faith. God did it all. God did it all. God, I didn't have to keep the law. He did it everything. I'm a recipient of God's grace. Okay, I got it. I'm saved. Now, can I continue to live the way I did? Because if I do, and if it's not of works, I can live the way I used to live, and God will continue to get grace, and if he continues to get grace, he'll get more and more glory. You see, that's the, 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 the human heart, so evil. Uh, okay, if it's all by grace, oh, this is great, man. I can go to play cards, look for women, do anything I want to do. God will extend more grace to me, and I'll be fine. Shall we continue in sin that God's might continue to abound? God forbid. The idea is don't even think it. Shouldn't even enter your mind. How sinful are you to think that because God extends grace to get you saved, you're going to continue to take advantage of God's grace by living the way you used to live. But the point is this. You should be able to stand up on New Year's Eve or any night where there's a gathering and they're sharing testimonies. You ought to be able to stand up and say, I'm not all that I ought to be. But I thank God that I'm not, I'm not what I used to be because by God's grace I've matured. And next year he ought to say I'm not all that I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I once was. And the next year I'm not all that I ought to be, but thank God I'm, because we're appropriating more of God's grace and more of God's grace by grace through faith. So what is being said in the beginning, we're under condemnation. We're justified through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Condemnation, justification. Now what chapter 6 is saying, 6, 7, and 8, is sanctification. I am set apart to mature, to grow, to develop in Christ. Condemnation, justification, sanctification. And I'm going quickly and almost done. If you look at chapter 8. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You all are familiar with this verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate from foreknowledge to predestination to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, one, them he also called, two, then they were justified, three, then we are glorified. From condemnation to justification to sanctification, the end product is glorification. When God is done with us, the process that he began when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we moved out of condemnation. How did we do it? Through justification. Jesus Christ died for my sin. 
So condemnation, justification, now sanctification. I've got to mature. I've got to grow. I've got to say I'm not all I ought to be, but I'm thank God I'm not what I once was. And when the process is completed from condemnation to justification to sanctification to glorification, when God is done with us, the mess we are in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually, when he is done, we are going to be perfected. I'm perfected Marvin. <laughs> no, when God is done with us, we're going to be perfect in every way. Condemnation to justification to sanctification to glorification. That's the truth. That's the doctrine. Now, having given us the doctrine, he says, I beseech you. I beg you. I implore you, based on these mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy unto God. Listen, which is your reasonable service? Why should I stop playing cards? Why should I stop going to the movies? Why should I stop? Well, learn truth in the Word of God and see if there are certain things that are inappropriate for you to be doing as a believer. I close now with verse 2. And be not conformed. I love that word, schemazo. Be not conformed. That is, do not allow this sinful, wicked world with all of its tentacles, with all of its solicitation, of all of its appeal to us in all different ways. He says, and be not conformed. Don't be schemed, shaped, molded by this sinful, wicked world in which we live. Be not schemazoed. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized. Don't allow this sinful world to come upon you, to shape you, to mold you, but instead be transformed from the Word of God, from divine truth. Look what he says. And be not schemazoed to this world. Don't allow it to fashion you. Be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that ye may be Prove, actually the Greek word is better translated approve in the doing of it, that you might approve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, and I close. If the one that we in the foolishness of our minds, if in the foolishness of our minds, the one that is the least among us, we think, or stand up in front of us, the one we think is the least among us from a variety of ways. If we were to see what that person will be like when God is finished with him or her, from condemnation to justification to sanctification to glorification, the one that we think is the least among us, if that one was to walk right up here, and if we were to see what they will be like or she will be like when they are glorified. The rest of us would be prone to fall on our faces and worship. God is going to glorify every one of us. And the more we grow and mature and develop along the way, it'll be easy for the Lord to make of all of us something beautiful. Thank you for your patience. You've been so gracious. And the Lord bless you and keep you.